easiest thing I've done was to get out from under the labels and to live the life that I live. The most difficult thing I've ever done was to believe that I can do it. Uh, the difference is that when you don't know what's impacting you and it's, it's something that, that's holding you down and you're not aware of it, there are things that when you, in, in my situation, you live in a dominant culture that is designed to destroy your sense of self and your belief in yourself and, and you have to learn ways in which you can begin to connect with this power that you have within yourself to handle where you are. The key is to be constantly in a perpetual process of discovering the truth of who you are and fighting constantly to look for ways in which you can escape the inner conversation. Between ages zero and five, we determine what's available to us and what's not available to us. And so that was a defining moment. I knew there are certain things I could not do, certain places I could not go. They used to have signs on Miami Beach that said, Jews, dogs, and coloreds not allowed. And so now you have to operate within the constraints of, of the dominant society and the things that they have created for you. And it's a challenge to see yourself beyond that and to work to get outside of that even after those laws have changed because that has become so much a part of you, you unconsciously operate within the parameters of what has been put in place. Like you go, to, you're driving on the expressway, the four or five, and, and, and you'll get off on an exit that you weren't going in that direction, but you unconsciously did it because you've done it so many times that many people, because they're not making a conscious, deliberate, determined effort to think outside of what life has thrown at them, they end up doing the same thing over and over and over again. Einstein said that thinking that has brought me this far has created some problems that this thinking can't solve. And so through relationships, through reading, through studies, through goals and dreams beyond your comfort zone, it, it allows you to begin to live out of your imagination as opposed to out of your history. D Disney said, the imagination is a preview of what's to come. They have to expose themselves to something that will give them a different vision of themselves. And in addition to that, they have to put themselves in a community of what I call OQP only quality people. A gentleman who dramatically transformed my life, I was a junior at Booker T. Washington High School in Miami, Florida, and I went in his class looking for another friend, and, and he said, go to the board and work this problem out for me. I said, sir, I can't do that. He said, why not? I said, uh, I'm not one of your students. He said, do it anyhow. And, and the other kids started laughing, saying, he's Leslie, he's DT. And he said, what's DT? He's, his brother is smart, but he's the dumb twin. And, and I said, I am, sir. And he came from behind his desk and he pointed at me, he said, don't you ever say that again. Someone's opinion of you does not have to become your reality. And he taught me three things. He said, if you want to become successful in life, young man, he said, number one, you got to change your mindset. He said, you don't get in life what you want, you get in life what you are. Number two, practice OQP, only quality people. You earn within two to three thousand dollars of your closest friends. I found that out, I left all my bro broke friends. I say, y'all gotta go. <laughs> Cause I used to be so broke, I'd pass the bank and trip the alarm, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and the third thing he said, develop your communication skills because once you open your mouth, you tell the world who you are. He said, those are three major things that you want to work on that will liberate you from living in Liberty City, living in poverty and over town. It will help to escape out of where you are right now because I see you watching me and I know you want more. I can see the hunger in your eyes. 
You get hungry by finding something that's you. I believe that all of us are born unique, but most of us die copies. You got to find out what is it that turns you on, what resonates with you. Uh, one of the things that I realized and what allowed me to become successful as a speaker, the speaking industry has been hijacked by people who speak to sell, and it's, it's okay to do that and make money. I speak to change lives because somebody spoke and changed my life. So this is my passion. This is my drive. This is something that I feel in my heart. And and so the key to that hunger-driven life is a heart-centered life. I didn't do what I'm doing for years because of my programming, because of the culture in which I was raised in. I would see other people with with degrees and PhDs and and MBAs and credentials I don't have, and I convinced myself I couldn't do it. But Mr. Washington, on that day, we became friends, and and he taught me not only someone's opinion of you does does not have to determine your reality. He said that you have to work on yourself, and you have to have an unstoppable attitude, and no excuse is acceptable, and you've got to to make it a, a, a priority, a non-negotiable in your life, and hold a, a constant vision of what it is you want to achieve, see it accomplished, and go all out. Find a way to win in spite of the setbacks, in spite of the disappointments, in spite of your failures. I, I tell people when I'm giving presentations, you will fail your way to success. I have a saying is life knocks you down, try and land on your back because if you can look up, you can get up. <laughs> and so those experiences of, of going after goals that's beyond your comfort zone and having relationships that will challenge you and surrounding yourself with coaches and mentors who can take you to a place within yourself that you can't go by yourself because you can't read the label when you're locked in the box. And so those experiences, they challenge you to go to that next level and continue to move forward in your life doing new and exciting things that eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has entered the heart of mankind what God has in store for you when you live a heart-centered life deciding that you're going to live a life that will outlive you. You're going to live a life that counts, a life that will build a legacy and change the planet. You know, Horace Mann said, we should be ashamed to die until we've made some major contribution to humankind. And so my goal is to make a, a major contribution to humankind. Every day when I get up, my mindset is, what is it that I can do to touch and impact somebody's life today? What is it, what does that look like? Don't live the life that has been given you. By the circumstances, by the people that's around you, that Sidney Poitier wrote a book called The Measure of a Man. And he said, when you go for a walk with someone, something happens without being spoken. He said, either you adjust to their pace or they adjust to your pace. Whose pace have you adjusted to? And so there are things that we pick up and we think that they're our choices, but they're the choices that we've been programmed by life to, to do, um, we, when we leave our homes in the morning, we're bombarded with over 6,000 advertising hits through Facebook, through Twitter, through Instagram, through television, through our phones and through our communities uh, and through the computers. And so all of these things are impacting us every day. So if you don't have a program for your mind, then your mind is going to be programmed and you'll find yourself doing things that you did not know and, and that they affected you, that they, through marketing techniques and strategies, that they will create a thirst within you. I came up in an era that said, if you built the best mousetrap, the world would be the path to your door. But if you know marketing, people will sleep outside your store to buy a telephone they've never touched or seen. I want you to look at something right now. 
think of some major goal you want, or maybe it's one you're already working on, and you have experienced a lot of setbacks, a lot of defeats. You've experienced a lot of disappointment. Maybe you've already given up. And maybe you just need a little fire, a little encouragement to get back in the game again. Here's what I want you to look at. There are winners, there are losers, and there are people who have not discovered how to win. And all they need is some coaching. All they need is some help and assistance, just a little support. All they need is some insight or a different strategy or plan of action to make some adjustments that will open up the key to a whole new future for them, that will give them access to the unlimited power that they have within themselves. That's all that they need. So what I want you to do is, is think about something you want for you, that's real for you, that's important for you, that will give your life some special meaning and power. And I don't even want you to say, I can do that. I don't want you to assume that. See, five years ago, when I started out in this area, I would not have been able to make the mental leap that I would be up to where I am right now. I don't want you to begin to just psych yourself out. No, no. I want you to be able to say something to yourself that will enable you to maintain a level of integrity with yourself. That when you say this, even when you face tremendous setbacks, it, it will be a benchmark to keep you in the game, to keep you moving forward and experimenting and readjusting your strategy and your plan of action, continuously looking for ways to win. So what is that something? When you got an idea, you want to move on. You might not have the money. You might not have the education. You might not have the support or the resources you need. What is that something? that can keep us going, that will enable us to act on our dream. What's one of those keys that will begin to help us to discover the secrets to our dream? Here's what I want you to repeat after me, please, with power and conviction. Say, it's possible. It's all I want you to do when you look at your dream. Just say to yourself every day, it's possible. Just say that every day to yourself, it's possible. Because what does that do? See. It begins to change your belief system. See, the way in which we operate, ladies and gentlemen, it's a manifestation of what we believe, what's possible for us. Whatever you've done up to this point, all that it really is, is a duplication, it's a reproduction of what you believe subconsciously that you deserve and what's possible for your life. Most people operate out of their personal history, out of their memory, things they've done, things they've experienced, things they've seen things that they have observed. What I'm suggesting that you operate out of a larger vision of yourself. I want you to see yourself doing what you want to do, experiencing what you want to experience it, having what you want to have, doing what it is that gives your life some meaning and value. Operate out of your imagination, not your memory. Because whenever you look at where you want to go, I'm wanting to warn you, you will have some conversation back here after you go through the data that you've experienced in life saying you can't do it. And so what you want to begin to do is ignore that inner conversation. Well, most people, ladies and gentlemen, when something happens to them, what they do is they begin to believe that that's the way it is. That's the way it's always been. And they can't see the possibility of it being any different. Example, before April 1954, the common belief, the universal belief, because it had been tried again and again and again, and people had failed, the belief was that man was not physically capable of breaking the four-minute barrier, that he could not run a mile in less than four minutes. That was the belief on the planet. It had never been done. But here's what happened, ladies and gentlemen. Roger Bannister came along, and he broke the four-minute barrier. Now, here's what's significant about that. Since that time, up to this day, over 20,000 people have done it, including high school kids. What changed? 20,000 people, what changed? Here's what happened when they got on the track. They knew it had been done. And because they knew it had been done, there was a new belief about this barrier, about this goal that was unreachable. 
And those 20,000 people got in the race believing, knowing in their heart that someone had done it, that it's possible that they could do it. And I'm saying that if you know anybody that had some goal, some dream, something they wanted to do, and they did it, then I'm saying that you know in your heart that if someone has done it, then you can do it. It's possible. And that if someone can make their dream become a reality, that it's, it's possible that you can make your dream become reality. And so as you begin to look at where you want to go, beginning to embrace that, it's possible. I'm blessed and highly favored. I've got a lot going for me. I've got some good stuff in me. And it's possible that I can bring my greatness out here in the universe. That I can do what I want to do. It's possible I can write my own book. I can have my own business. I, I can take the trip and travel around the world. It's possible I can bounce back from adversity and reinvent my life. It's possible, regardless of where I am, the things can get better for me. It's possible. I'm thinking about two men right here in Chicago who are fairly successful, similar background, educated. They worked for a corporation for many years and they were among many people that were laid off. Two guys who were very good friends. One went out looking for a job for several weeks along with the other one and they faced disappointment and rejection again and again and again. They couldn't find any work, which is the story of many people across this country. One guy stopped. He became discouraged. He stopped going. He stayed home looking at television, became very argumentative and toxic with his wife, drinking beer, getting on the phone, talking to his other negative unemployed friends. And he just gave up. The other guy kept looking for a job everywhere he could go. Every time he could get an opportunity. Kept asking people, networking, checking the newspapers every day. Kept going everywhere he could, trying to find a job. You have too much education. You're overqualified. You won't be here long enough. He kept going. He kept going. He went to a place and said, look here, I'll tell you what. If you can't hire me, and I know you can use my talents, abilities, and skills, I don't want to sit home and do nothing. Just, just let me do some volunteer work. You don't have to give me anything, all right? I just want to work. I want to be busy. Guy said, okay, it's on you now, but don't, don't expect me to give you anything. It's okay. This guy came in and worked. He was the first one there. The last one to leave was the best employee there. About four weeks later, one of the top managers quit. They were looking for a replacement. Guess who they selected? This other guy. This guy who was volunteering his time, he got the job. What was the difference between the two men? Eyesight and mind sight. Eyesight is judging on what you see. Judging according to appearances. But mind sight is how you interpret what you see. One guy said, it's not possible, it's over, I'm finished. I can't do it. I can't make it. He surrendered. I faced rejection again and again. I'm not going anymore. There are no jobs out there. But this other guy, he felt that in spite of the no's and rejections, in spite of how bad the economy is, in spite of what the newspapers are saying, that it's possible that somebody somewhere will give me a job. He just kept going, thinking it was possible. And guess what, ladies and gentlemen? That's what we have to do with our dreams. right now I want you to think about your dream because I'm in a room full of dreamers think about your dream right now I want you to think about it and envision it now ladies and gentlemen let me share something with you I do not believe that any of us have dreams that were not given to us for the purpose of accomplishing those particular dreams and I want to share something with you that has changed my life. 
I started out, as was indicated by Jack, it's a very humble beginnings. I don't know what that dream is that you have. I don't care how far-fetched it might appear to be. I don't care how disappointing it might have been as you've been working toward that dream. But here's what I know, that that dream that you're holding in your mind, that it's possible. Let's say that together, please. It's possible. See, sometimes we can't say, I can do that. But what we can say, that it's possible that I can have my dream as we run toward it, as we work on it day in and day out. No one, ladies and gentlemen, could have convinced me when I started out just over six years ago working on my dream. And I want you to think about whatever your dream is. Because I was willing to take a chance, and most people won't do that. Most of the people that you talk to to try and bring them into the business, these are not risk takers. Most people have done all that they're ever going to do. They raise a family, they earn a living, and then they die. But people who are running toward their dreams, life has a special kind of meaning. And here's what I will share with you, that in the process of working on your dreams, you are going to incur, incur a lot of disappointment, a lot of failure, a lot of pain, a lot of setbacks, a lot of defeats. But in the process of doing that, you will discover some things about yourself that you don't know right now. What you will realize is that you have greatness within you. What you'll realize is that you're more powerful than you can ever begin to imagine. What you will realize is that you are greater than your circumstances, that you don't have to go through life being a victim. As Jack indicated, I was born in Miami, Florida, in an area called Liberty City, in an abandoned building on a hard linoleum floor with my twin brother. We were six weeks of age, we were adopted. When I was in fifth grade, I was identified as EMR, labeled, educable, mentally retarded, put back from the fifth grade into the fourth grade and stayed in that category until I got out of high school. I don't have any college training, but I met a high school teacher who one day changed my life. I was waiting on another student, and when he came in, he said to me, young man, go to the board and write what I'm about to tell you. And I said, I, I can't do that, sir. And he said, why not? I said, I'm not one of your students. He said, it doesn't matter. Follow my directions now. I said, I can't do that, sir. He said, why not? I said, because I'm educable, mentally retarded. And he came from behind his desk and he looked at me. He said, don't ever say that again. Someone's opinion of you does not have to become your reality. And that man, Mr. Leroy Washington, did something for me. He started planting seeds in my mind that enabled me to begin to dream as Dexter has been doing for you. And ladies and gentlemen, I started working on my dream. And most people don't work on their dreams. Why? For many years, I didn't. One is because of fear, the fear of failure. What if things don't work out? And the fear of success. What if they do and I can't handle it? The other thing is that most people, ladies and gentlemen, they get comfortable. They stop growing, they stop working on themselves, they stop stretching, they stop pushing themselves, and they end up becoming very cynical about life, and they throw in the towel on themselves and on their families and on their dreams. And the other thing is that most people don't feel worthy. What I'm doing now, I could have been doing years ago, but because I did not have a college education, because I didn't believe in myself, because I allowed other people's opinion of me to control my destiny, I didn't act on my ideas. So I applaud you for your dreaming, for your running toward your dream. I applaud you for believing in yourself because that's what life is about, stretching and challenging, looking for ways that you can begin to improve yourself. And ladies and gentlemen, as a result, of stretching out, of acting on my dream, and I don't know what that dream is for you, I can tell you that it's possible. 
No one could have convinced me that after just over six years, I would have my own book entitled Live Your Dreams. Just over six years, I would have five specials on public television. Just over six years, I've done motivational speaking for AT&T, Procter & Gamble, McDonald's Corporation, Xerox, IBM, just over six years. I will now have my own talk show that will premiere on Monday, Labor Day. I'm saying to you, your dream is possible. Your dream is possible. But not only is it important that you believe and begin to know that it's possible for you to live your dream as you run toward it, but I've done something that I want to share with you called Choosing Your Future. In fact, I've developed a set of tapes talking about how to begin to create your own reality by choosing your future. And not only is it important for you to know it's possible for you to choose your future, but it's necessary that you work on yourself, that you develop yourself. It's necessary that you get the energy drainers out of your life, people who don't want anything, people who are not striving, people who are not challenging themselves, people who aren't growing, people who have stopped dreaming. It's necessary that you align yourself with people and attract people into your business who are hungry, people who are unstoppable and unreasonable, people who are refusing to leave life just as it is and who want more. My mother used to say, birds of a feather flock together. If you run around with losers, you will end up a loser. It's necessary that you get the losers out of your life if you want to live your dream. It's necessary to know that everybody won't see it, that everybody won't join you, that everybody won't have the vision. It's necessary to know that that a lot of people like to complain, but they don't want to do anything about their situation. That you are an uncommon breed. You know, you have to know within yourself that I can do this. Even if no one else sees it for me, I must see it for myself. That's necessary. It's also, ladies and gentlemen, necessary that you be creative when you're working on your ideas. That you understand the importance of, of changing up of readjusting your strategies. Many times we can have a great idea, but if you're not advancing it in the right way and things don't happen, you become discouraged and think the idea doesn't work. No, that's not true. It's necessary that we become creative. I remember when I was in New York walking down the street and a guy approached me and said, hey, mister, can I shine your shoes? And I said, no, I'm in a hurry, I don't have time. I kept walking, someone else said, hey man, your shoes look cluddy. May I shine your shoes? I said, no, I don't have time, I'm sorry, I'm busy. And I was walking fast and many people solicited me for my business and then finally a young man stepped in front of me and he said, excuse me. And he started counting, 97, 98, 99, 100. He said, sir? I said, yes. He said, come here, please. I said, what is it? He said, today is my birthday. And every year, just to thank God for another year of life, the 100th person who passes my shoe shine stand, I offer them a free shoe shine. Would you give me the honors? I said, why, sure. I got up on the shoe shine stand, George, and I sat there and, and he shined my shoes diligently. And when I got down, I looked at them, they were sparkly. And I was walking away and I said, thank you. And I stopped, I said, excuse me, but how much do you usually charge? He said, only $2. I said, I tell you what, today's your birthday. Here's five, keep the change. He said, thank you. As I was walking away, Looking in the opposite direction of other people coming, he started counting again. 97, 98, 99, 100. <laughs> it's necessary that you be flexible, that you are always thinking of how can I improve this better. This is a customer-driven economy. It's necessary for you to always explore various ways in which you can improve the quality of service that you're providing for the people in your organization. I remember something a major company had talked about the extra value service they were providing for their customers. And the lady who had the news conference summarized it this way. She said, it's not our intention to satisfy our customers or to please our customers. Our intention is to amaze them. It's necessary if you're going to compete today that you look for ways to amaze your customers by being one of those individuals that keep your commitments, that keep your word that's relentless. 
it's necessary as you work with the people that you bring into your, your organization that they see that you are a good example of a person to work with because you model integrity and determination and ambition and truth and honesty and the way in which you conduct business. The next step is, that is you. That is you. That no one can do it for you but you. And even though you face disappointments, even though you will experience some setbacks, it goes with the territory. You must understand that. I remember I was playing a game with my nine-year-old son, John Leslie, and I beat him 10 straight games in a game called Connect Four. And finally, I said, John Leslie, I'm bored. I don't want to play you anymore. And I got up, and I said, I'm ready to go to sleep now. And repeat out to me, please. Let's say do this together. It's not over until I win. John Leslie said, no, you can't go now, Dad. I said, why? He said, it's not over until I win. That was his attitude. We sat down and we played several other games. And finally, after the 11th game, John Leslie won and he got up and he yawned. And he said, I'm ready to go to sleep now. And I'm saying to you, what if all of us took that attitude after we face a rejection and a no or we have a meeting and no one shows up or somebody say you can count on me and they don't come through what if we have that kind of attitude the cause repossessed nobody believes in you you've lost again and again and again the lights are cut off but you're still looking at your dream reviewing it every day and say to yourself it's not over until i win Life will yield to you. Now here's the next step. Repeat after me, please. It's possible. I can live my dream. It's necessary. I work on myself. Surround myself with winners. Become creative. It's me. I've got to make it happen. It's not over until I win. The next thing that's important to know, yes, it's possible that you can choose your future and direct the course of your life as you run toward your dream. It's necessary that you have goals, that you write those goals down, that you plan, that you think constantly of how you can begin to improve what it is that you're doing. If it's your presentations, if it's your recruiting skills, whatever that is, it's also necessary that you look for ways to always find a way to pull it out when everybody else thinks that you are defeated. That you've got to take personal responsibility to know that in order to become successful, you've got to make it your personal business to do it. But the next thing, ladies and gentlemen, I want to share with you that some of you already know that it's hard. It's not easy. It's hard changing your life. It was hard when just over three years ago in the Penobscot building in Detroit, Michigan, where I was operating my business and I fell on some hard times and I was sleeping in my office. It was hard coming into the lobby and the security said, excuse me, Mr. Brown, can we see you for a moment? And I said, yes. And I walked up to the counter and he gave me an envelope. And he said, would you mind reading it here? And I opened the envelope and the envelope was from management that said, this is an office tower. It's not a hotel. Please do not sleep in your office. And I said, excuse me, sir. I said, I just work long hours in creating my business. I'm an entrepreneur. And right now, things are bad for me. But they're not going to be this way always. And I just asked for the opportunity to continue to operate like I'm doing. I'm not trying to make this my home. And it was hard coming through the lobby. And sometimes they would laugh. There's a guy talking about becoming successful. And look at him. He's bathing in the bathroom upstairs on the 21st floor. He sleeps on the floor. Him and two other dreamers up there. Look at him. It was hard, ladies and gentlemen, coming to speak to people. And I was facing financial difficulties in my own life. 
I was behind on my bills and my dreams, and I'm saying to them, you can live your dream. It was hard, ladies and gentlemen. It was very difficult to pick myself up each day believing that I could do it. There were times that I doubted myself. I said, God, why, why is this happening to me? I'm just trying to take care of my children and my mother. I'm not trying to steal a rock from anybody. Why did this have to happen to me? It was very hard. And here's what I want to say to you. For those of you that have experienced some hardships, don't give up on your dream. No one could have convinced me by holding on, by continuing to push forward, by continuing to run toward my dream, that one day I would have my own talk show. It's a long shot, ladies and gentlemen, from Liberty City, an abandoned building on a floor never knowing my mother or father. It's a long shot being here with you today in this dome in Atlanta. It's a long shot. No college training, labeled, educable, mentally retarded. But I kept running toward my dream. Don't stop. toward your dream. It's very important as you hold on to that dream, there are moments when you're going to doubt yourself. There are rough times are going to come, but they have not come to stay. They have come to pass. It's very important for you to know that. Don't say I'm having a bad day. Sam, I'm having a character building day. It's very important for you to believe that you are the one to make this happen. I remember this high school teacher, Mr. Leroy Washington, at the end of school one June, it was just a few days before we were supposed to leave, and I just got my report card. And it indicated that I'd fail history and I'd fail English and I would have to go to summer school. And I was feeling within myself that I was a failure, that I, I'm slower than most people and getting paperwork. And, and I was feeling down on myself and, and, and very negative. And Mr. Washington was giving a speech to the graduating seniors and I was in 11th grade. And even though I wasn't supposed to be in there, I went in there because the speech he was giving, that speech was for me. And as he talked, my heart began to beat fast. Tears began to run by my eyes, and, and I was in the back just listening to him because he said, and he was a very dramatic man, I still talk to him to this day. He said, as graduating seniors of Booker T. Washington High School, I want you to know that you are blessed and highly favored and that as you go toward the future, begin to know that you have greatness within you. And if just one of you here begin to envision yourselves as being blessed and highly favored to reach your goals, if just one of you capture the essence of what that means, that you have greatness within you and a responsibility to manifest that greatness, that you can make your parents proud, you can make your school proud, you can touch millions of people's lives, and the world will never be the same again because you came this way. And the students gave him a rousing standing ovation. And as he left the auditorium, I ran down the steps and I caught him in the parking lot. I said, Mr. Washington? He said, yes. I said, do you remember me, sir? He said, no. I said, uh, my name is Leslie Brown, my mother. She works in the cafeteria here. I'm one of the twins, Leslie and Wesley. I said, Mr. Washington, but you know, you know, I got these big dreams. You know, I like talking to people. I love people. I said, I, I want to work with people, and I got this dream of buying my mama a home. Could, could I do that, Mr. Washington? He said, it's possible, Mr. Brown. And as he walked away, I called him again. I said, Mr. Washington, 
He said, what do you want now? I said, um, I'm the one, sir. I said, I'm the one. You, you remember me, sir. I'm Miss Mamie Brown's boy. I'm the one. I'm the one. And you must feel that, that that's why you're here, because you are the one. And I remember when PBS first played one of my specials called You Deserve, one Sunday afternoon in Miami, Florida. I had some friends call him to tell him to tune in. And he watched the program. He called me in Detroit, and I answered the phone. And I said, hello. He said, may I speak to Les Brown, please? I said, who's calling? He said, you know who this is. I said, oh, Mr. Washington, it's you. He said, you were the one, weren't you? I said, yes, sir. He said, and you were so crazy. I said, I know, but I'm rich now. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's not going to be easy. It was hard laying on the floor of the Penobscot building, looking out of the window, daydreaming, saying, Les, can you do this? Can you make this happen? I used to listen to tapes day in and day out about See You at the Top, my, my great friend Zig and, and, and Dennis Waitley and different other motivational speakers and Dr. Norman Vincent Peale. And Dexter saying, don't let nobody steal your dream. I used to ask myself, can I do this? And something said within me, you're the one. You're the one. And let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. While you're here, and before you go back home to your respective cities and communities, write down at least five reasons on why you deserve your dream on why you won't give up, what's going to make you unstoppable, why you must be unreasonable, because logical, practical thinking says you can't do it today. But if you want to produce unreasonable results in your life, like living your dream and taking charge of your destiny, you've got to be an unreasonable person. You've got to be an uncommon person. So write down the reasons of why you're here. My first major goal was to buy my mother a home. And let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen, what, what will reasons do, Les? Nietzsche said, if you know the why for doing, you can endure almost anyhow. What do you mean by that? If you know why you're doing something, when the hard times come and they're gonna come, when the disappointments and the rejections come and they're gonna come by the truckloads, your reasons will be your rod and staff to comfort you to pick you up once again. I got a saying on one of my tapes, if life knocks you down, try and land on your back. Because if you can look up, you can get up. Let your reasons get you back up. I remember when I, I bought the home for my mother and she came out of the car. When I opened the door, I said, Mom, I think I know these people in this house. That was my first major goal. And then I couldn't conceal it anymore. I said, Mama, I got this for you. And as she went from room to room, looking at the house and saying, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. No one ever could have convinced me that this could have happened to me. And she looked at me and she said, Leslie, and you caused me so much problems as a boy. You were always into stuff. She said, no one could have convinced me that day when I walked in that house and this lady was holding you and your brother. And she said, ma'am, I want you to promise me two things. And she said, what is it? She says, one, promise me that you won't separate them. She said, I want them raised together. I want them to know each other. I got pregnant while my husband was away in the war and I can't keep them. Promise me that you won't separate them. 
She said, I promise I won't. I've never had children. I promise I won't separate them. And she said, promise me that you'll never tell them about who I am because if my husband ever found out, he would kill me. She said, I promise. And she said that she gave them to us and, and she kind of cried and she, and she was walking out the door and she looked at my adopted mother. She said, remember, don't you separate them. She said, I swear to God, I won't. I won't separate them, I'll keep them together. And she said, as I held y'all in my arms, I never had any children of my own. I didn't know how I was going to do it. But I knew with the help of God, I will do it. And ladies and gentlemen, my mother had a dream of having children and raising us. She didn't know how she was going to do it. You're going to be just like that. And some of you are already there. Well, you don't know how. You're going to make this happen, but you just feel within yourself some way, somehow, with the help of God, I'm going to make it happen. Repeat after me, please. No matter how bad it is, or how bad it gets, I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it. Shake somebody's hand on your right and left and say, you got the right stuff. So yes, it's possible for you to live your dream. It's necessary that you associate with winners, that you work your system, that you are relentless, that you never give up. It's you, you've got to take personal responsibility. You've got to make it your personal business to make it happen. And you've got to resolve within yourself that I can do this, that it's hard, but you've got to say, I'm the one. I'm the one to make this happen. I'm the one to become successful in this business. As you work to help other people to become successful, that feeds your success. But you know it's going to be hard, but find out what will make it worth it for you. I told Mr. Washington I wanted to become a disc jockey. Someone asked me to tell this story. And he said, Les Brown, he said, if you want to do anything worthwhile in life, you've got to be hungry. And so I started working to develop myself. He said, I want you to practice every day being a disc jockey. I said, but I don't have any job now. He said, it doesn't matter. He said that it's better to be prepared for an opportunity and not have one than to have an opportunity and not be prepared. So every day I was working to develop myself. And that's what you must do. And as I was working to develop myself, I applied for a job as a disc jockey, WMB on Miami Beach. I went to a guy named Milton Butterball. I said, how you doing, Mr. Butterball? I'd like to get a job as a disc jockey. He looked at me, he said, do you have any broadcast background? I said, no, sir, I don't. Do you have any journalism background? I said, no, sir, I don't. He said, we don't have any jobs available. I said, yes, sir. I went back to Mr. Washington and I told him, he said, don't take it personally. He said, most people are so negative, they will have to say no seven times before they say yes. He said, go back again. So I went back again. I said, how you doing, Mr. Butterball? My name is Les Brown. He said, I know what your name is. What do you want? I said, I'd like to know whether or not you have any jobs at this jockey, sir. He said, didn't I just tell you yesterday we didn't have any jobs? I said, yes, sir, but I know whether or not somebody got laid off or somebody was fired, sir. He said, no one was laid off or fired. Now get on out of here. I came back the next day. Hello, Mr. Butterball. How are you? He said, fine. What do you want now? I said, I'd like to know whether or not you got any jobs, sir. Didn't I tell you the last two days we didn't have any jobs? I said, yes, sir, but I don't know whether or not somebody got sick or somebody died, sir. He said, no one got sick or died. Now, don't come back here and throw me out again. I came back the next day like I was seeing him for the first time. I said, hello, Mr. Butterball, how are you? He looked at me with rage. He said, go get me some coffee. I said, yes, sir. And I went to get him some coffee. After a while, I would get their lunch and dinner, and I would go in the control rooms and take the disc jockeys their food, and I would not leave until they would ask me to leave. Then they would started trusting me to pick up entertainers that came to town, entertainers like the Four Tops and the Temptations and Donna Ross and the Supremes. 
I would drive them all over Miami Beach in the disc jockeys, big long Cadillacs. I didn't have any driver's license, but I was driving like I had some. <laughs> and one day, one Saturday afternoon, while I was at the radio station, a guy named Rock was drinking while he was on the air. I was the only one there looking at him through the control room windows, walking back and forth, young, ready, and hungry. I was saying, drink, rock, drink. Drink, rock. I'd have gone to get him some more if he'd asked me to. Pretty soon the phone rang and it was the general manager. And I answered the phone. I said, hello? He said, Les, this is Mr. Klein. I said, I know. He said, Rock can't finish his program. I said, I know. He said, would you call one of the other DJs in? I said, yes, sir. I hung the phone up. I said, now he must be think I'm crazy. <laughs> I called my mom and my girlfriend, Cassandra. I said, y'all turn up the radio and come out on the front porch. I'm about to come on the air. I waited for about 20 minutes, and I called him back. I said, Mr. Klein, I can't find nobody. He said, young boy, do you know how to work the controls? I said, yes, sir. He said, go in there and don't say nothing here. I said, yes, sir. <laughs> I couldn't wait to get behind those controls. I put on an old Stevie Wonder record called Fingertips. I sat down behind that turntable. I said, look out, this is me, LB, Triple P. Les Brown, your platter playing papa. There were none before me, and there will be none after me. Therefore, that makes me the one and only. Young and single and love to mingle, certified, bona fide, and dubitably qualified to bring you satisfaction, a whole lot of action. Look out, baby, I'm your love man. I was hungry. I was hungry. You got to be hungry. You gotta be hungry. So ladies and gentlemen, if you wanna make your dream become reality, the people that are running at their dreams know that it's possible that you can live your dream, that it's necessary, that you're relentless, that you have a plan of action, that you are creative. The people that are living their dream are finding winners to attach themselves to. The people that are living their dreams are the people that know that it's, if it's going to happen, it's up to them. And they're resolving within themselves, it's not over until I win. The people that are running after their dream know they're going to have hard times. They keep on running because they're saying within themselves, I'm the one, I'm the one. No matter how bad it is or how bad it gets, I'm going to make it. The people that are running after their dreams are the people that are hungry. Shake somebody's hand on your right and left and say, you gotta be hungry. And as you run towards your dream, I wanna dedicate this to you that I love very much. I wanna thank Dexter and all of you. It's something that I'm known by. It's on our tapes called Choosing Your Future, and it says simply this, that if you want a thing bad enough to go out and fight for it, to work day and night for it, to give up your time, your peace, and your sleep for it, if all that you dream and scheme is about it, and life seems useless and worthless without it, and if you gladly sweat for it and fret for it and plan for it and lose all your terror of the opposition for it, and if you simply go after that thing that you want with all of your capacity, strength and sagacity, faith, hope and confidence, and stern pertinacity, if neither cold poverty, famish or gold, sickness or pain or body and brain can keep you away from the thing that you want, if dogged and grim you besiege and beset it, with the help of God you'll get it. This is Mrs. Mamie Brown. Brown's baby boy, Leslie Calvin Brown, saying it's been a plum-pleasing pleasure as well as a privilege. Thank you.